Hello, and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about the shifting winds of change in world trade and how those changes will affect manufacturing and the supply chain. My guest today is Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien is the Executive Director of the Center for International Trade and Transportation. Welcome, Tom, and thanks for joining us again on Talking Points. Dave, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I say again because I believe this is your third appearance now on Talking Points, and every time you're here we talk about the winds of change in um, world trade, and uh, if there's one constant, it's that there is no constant in world trade because it's always changing. Yeah, that's right. You can have uh, the same discussion uh, day after day, and it will always change because uh, it's a very dynamic industry. Well, let's talk about what we've been thinking about and hearing about for the past year or so, and that's the ongoing trade conflict with China between the U.S. and China. Starts yeah. with allegations of improper trade practices. Then there are some tariffs levied. There are reciprocal reactions on the other side. Um, and then the job owning continues and additional talk about upping the ante on some of those mm -hmm. tariffs. Seems like we're in a lull right now while we wait for the 70th right. annual Communist Party Central Planning Committee meeting in China, which was started by uh, Mao Zedong in 1949. But that being said, it seems like uh, the predictions for dire consequences from a trade war with China did not come to pass. We are not as bad off as many people feared or predicted. And I think part of that is because the supply chain is always moving. Go. Yeah, it's, al it's always yeah. moving and it's, it, it aims toward resiliency. Um, and shippers always have alternatives, right? And so while you know, we hope we're out of the water with the impact of the tariffs, supply chains don't like uncertainty and there's still some cert uncertainty out there um, that gives the supply chain pause. Um, but if you think back in time to um, the congestion, the good old days of 2005 when the world economy was strong and the problem was too many goods moving through, um, the supply chain had to adjust then, right, to avoid congestion. Um, when we have labor issues um, at a port, wherever it might be in the world, the supply chain is forced to adjust. When the Panama Canal um, expands, right, and that shifts uh, perhaps the balance, of, the balance of trade and provides alternatives to, to global shippers, the supply chain adjusts. So this is... I, I would say it's more than a hiccup. This, is, this has been um, a serious disruption injected into the global supply chain, um, but it looks for the path of least resistance. That's what it does. And that diversification of the supply chain that you were talking about, it would seem that in the long term, even if we have some short-term difficulties with the trade war with China, in the long term, aren't we better off when we see a benefit from a diversified supply chain and a diversified range of where manufacturing occurs? That's certainly the glass half full approach, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think there is some truth to that. Um, I mentioned 2005 and after that we had shippers who um, created a, a more diversified port portfolio, um, if you'd like, uh, where they sort of looked at bringing in goods through not just Southern California, but a Pacific Northwest port and a Northeast port and a, a Southeast or a Gulf port um, to hedge their bets a little bit. Um, so I think that will be likely one of the outcomes. Now, we're already seeing um, a decentralization of manufacturing activity in China now with rising wages there. So China is serving more as a hub um, than the sole source of, of output for global trade. It works in conjunction with places like Vietnam and Thailand and Cambodia. Um, and so I think we'll see that continue a little bit. Um, but China is such a significant player that um, the ability to adjust will take some time. Let's talk about manufacturing a little closer to home, and I'm thinking specifically about Mexico now. That's another thing that has developed over the past five to ten years that a lot of people weren't really that aware of. Now we're starting to hear about it a lot more, and that is the fact that the Mexican economy is actually quite strong. And we hear about immigration through Mexico, but truth is most of the immigrants, the vast majority of those immigrants are actually coming from south of Mexico, from mm -hmm. Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador because the economy in Mexico is actually pretty stable right now compared to the way it's been maybe 20, 30 years ago. 
So, and that's because there's a lot more manufacturing. BMW just announced that, or actually just opened a plant mm -hmm. in June, where they are going to manufacture 175,000 vehicles a year. And that means they're going to join about eight other auto, major yeah. auto manufacturers that are already in Mexico. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, what accounts for all of this vitality and robust economic development in Mexico? Well, it's, it's actually not a short-term trend. I mean, for those of us in California, our proximity to Mexico has been important for, for trade for uh, a very long time. Um, I think the rest of the country is, is coming to understand the important relationship that both of our trading partners uh, in North America, Canada and Mexico, uh, play in an integrated North American uh, production and consumption market. Um, so, as you said, uh, this is now with the eighth largest or the eighth uh, latest manufacturer to produce there, um, and it's a it's a countrywide phenomenon. It's no longer just sort of a notion of a border uh, border trade or manufacturing centers uh, located along the border that serve U.S. Uh, U.S. production. Um, but it's now a more well-developed uh, domestic market. So Mexico's production serves not only export trade, but uh, its, own, uh, its own users, its own consumers as well. Um, and it's a more diversified economy, and it's a higher tech uh, manufacturing base that's supporting um, global trade. Mm -hmm. And as far as Mexico taking this commanding role in manufacturing, for auto manufacturing in particular, it means that they have moved up in terms of their uh, trade status with the United States. Right. And China has actually moved down. So now we have Canada and Mexico one and two. China has dropped down to number three. What's the long-term impact of that, potentially? Well, I mean, it, it continues, uh, again, a trend that we started seeing more than a decade ago, where uh, rising wage rates in China offset some of the, uh, the value of an extended supply chain. And all of a sudden, transport costs became a lot more important. And both Mexico and Canada um, provide a shorter time to market uh, in the U.S. And so if you get the right combination of labor costs, uh, regulatory, uh, you're minimizing regulatory complexity in transport, um, then you, you get um, a, a, a North American trade market that I think um, we'll see as being preeminent for, for the near term and the long term. And if we compare the North American trade market, as you refer to it, uh, we're really looking at an economy between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico worth uh, $22 trillion. Dollars, yeah. And if you look at the EU, for example, the entire European Union market, that's only about 17 trillion. Yeah. So we're already bigger than the EU. And it would appear that with the developments in Mexico, we're actually growing. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the European Union is a really complex organization. It's not just um, an economic market. There's, a, there's political integration there as well. Uh, with a larger number of countries involved, and so it's much more complex. Um, for all of the challenges that we recognize have come with the, the, the birth of NAFTA and its transformation into the USMCA, um, and whatever that might look like when, when it's finally adopted, um, it's, an, it's an easier discussion perhaps to have because the number of players is limited and we're talking about um, markets. Right. Um, so I think and, and the, the trend over over recent years has really been for more bilateral trade than multilateral, simply because it's easier to get past uh, when you have fewer countries involved. So for all of the fits and starts with USMCA and the reality is NAFTA was constantly being revisited. Um, it just wasn't being done in the spotlight. People are always looking at what changes we need to make from an environmental perspective or a labor perspective. So the high visibility of USMCA, um, I don't think is a reflection of the difficulties um, or ultimately the, the success. Um, I think it's perhaps a reflection of some of the political realities that we have in the country right now. But I see longer term benefits and I see all three countries embracing it. Um, moving forward. And I think that it's important, as you mentioned, that the EU has a kind of political integration, as you said, that doesn't exist here among the three countries of North America. 
And uh, that's actually probably an advantage, I would think, because uh, the three countries of North America, we're able to keep our own currencies, mm. we're able to have our own political sovereignty, and we also don't have to answer to a centralized bureaucratic authority in Brussels that people are very unhappy about, and particularly in Britain, and that's one of the reasons why Brexit occurred. So Yeah, yeah I agree. I think that, that the, the challenges that we're seeing now in Europe um, are clearly a reflection of the complexity of those relationships, and they're perhaps much more vulnerable to the changing nature of political tides. Um, and I think despite the, the, um, the posturing of, of leadership in all of the countries in North America, um, there's a long history of coordination and integration of our economic markets, the production in automobile manufacturing, not just in Mexico, as you've indicated, but in Canada, between the Canada and the U.S. as well. Um, it creates some long-term stability that can survive those political shocks. Let's talk about China again for a moment. Uh, and, of course, Hong Kong has been in the spotlight yeah. because of all of the protests and all of the um, kind of instability that we've seen in Hong Kong. In your view, what is the best case scenario for the ultimate outcome in Hong Kong and what's the worst case scenario? Yeah, and I, I don't claim to be an, an Asian expert, but just in as, a, as an observer of how it impacts trade, um, I suppose the status quo is in many ways um, a best option. Um, uh, as a signal perhaps of incremental change with what might happen internally in, in China, um, again, going back to my earlier comment about the supply chain not liking uncertainty, well, Hong Kong has provided a lot of uncertainty um, over the past uh, six to eight months. Um, obviously, the worst case scenario, I think, is if the challenges in Hong Kong um, uh, are replicated um, in China in the, on the mainland itself, and whether that internal uh, instability becomes regional instability, and then it's not just a, a question of trade. It's, we have a much bigger issue at hand. Well, we only have about a minute before the break, Tom, so I want to ask you quickly, what about some of the other changes that have occurred in the, over the last few years in regard to world trade? We know that the ocean liners have consolidated, and we also know that uh, uh, the Suez Canal route has become more popular now that India has emerged. So. If you can do it in less than a minute, what are your <laughs> thoughts about those two developments? Well, I just think it's a, it's a, it's a shift in the center of, of gravity, both geographic um, and perhaps economic. Um, the production happening uh, further west in Asia uh, provides different alternatives. Um, consolidation in um, not only the ocean liner industry, but in other aspects of, of trade um, has, has an impact at a place like uh, like the U.S., um, where our, our favorable uh, status as a trading partner is constantly challenged. Okay, and on that note, we'll have to take a break. Stay tuned. When we come back with, from the break, we'll talk about manufacturing in the U.S. Is it coming back? Stay with us. International business, huh? Number one, know the culture of that country. Come alive with Pepsi. Translated into Chinese is, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. PepsiCo made that mistake in Taiwan. Learn about strategic planning, government policy, and policy analysis, and so much more. You can become a part of this exciting career field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Dr. Tom O'Brien, the Executive Director of the Center for International Trade and Transportation. We're talking about world trade, manufacturing, and the supply chain. And Tom, before the break, I mentioned that we're going to talk about manufacturing mm -hmm. returning to the U.S. Now, we have seen, at least in 2018, we saw a resurgence of manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, we gained about 264,000 new mm -hmm. jobs in manufacturing across the country. This represents the largest gain, single year gain, since about 1988, and it means that manufacturing employment is at the highest level it's been in about a decade. Now, in the past decade, or maybe a dozen years or so, 
we've been hearing about the pessimism with manufacturing in the U.S. that you know you can't bring those jobs back. That's just the way it goes. The economy is evolving. It's never going to come back. <clears throat> Excuse me. But now we have seen this this uptick. It's not where it was in 1979 at the right. peak, but it is an uptick. So does that suggest that uh, it is possible with the right policy mix, the right incentives, the right conditions to bring that manufacturing back to the U.S.? Uh, I think it's certainly an indication that policy matters, right? Um, incentives do matter. Um, the question is uh, with regard to the sustainability of the policy in the longer term impacts. Um, yeah, for a decade we've been talking about, you know, moving from offshoring to nearshoring, right? We talked about the, the relationship between places like Mexico and the U.S. Um, and now to, uh, to reshoring, right, which is bringing some of those jobs uh, back home. Um, and yeah, when, when, when manufacturers look at sort of the total cost of production, they do take into account things like regulatory bottlenecks, transit time, political stability. Um, and there's a significant benefit um, to working in a place that you know, right? Um, certain sectors, I think, will benefit more so perhaps than others. And the first uh, manufacturing jobs that came back uh, really did depend to a certain extent on a balance between increased labor and increased use of technology and automation. So I do think the nature of the jobs will change. Um, you indicated sort of 79 being a high point. I don't know that it's realistic to sort of make that the, the goal. Um, but yeah, it, it's clearly what we're seeing now is an indication that um, you can take proactive steps um, to create a favorable environment for manufacturing to, to return and to occur. And as we've seen this increase in manufacturing, we've also seen um, some concerns raised about automation yeah. and robotics and how long will those jobs last given the, the, ever, ev the ever evolving right. state of technology. So if we're seeing the implementation of technology in the workplace, and we're certainly seeing it in the harbor. That's one of the places where we're, it's right. front and center stage. So where do we go in the future with this automation and manufacturing and where all of that is going to wind up 10, 15 years from now? I think the first thing we have to do is admit that it's a reality and coming and prepare for it. Um, and that means having some very difficult discussions about what jobs will survive and others that perhaps won't. Um, and there's a, a broader cultural discussion that needs to happen, has, has to happen about um, the importance of work, the culture of work, and what it means to the individual, right? You can't divorce those two topics. Um, there, I, I think it is fair to say, however, that the changing nature of work and technology does bring opportunities. Um, it requires us to, to pivot a little bit and train people differently and be willing to, to um, educate ourselves differently than perhaps we have in the past. But you mentioned the, the port sector, and I think um, with the additional use of technology on the docks will come some new opportunities. The introduction of sort of zero emission vehicles uh, in the form of yard equipment or in trucks uh, creates new opportunities in maintenance and repair, in, um, in uh, testing and diagnostics, all of those things. Um, the other thing where I think we have to look ahead is where is there an intersection of the different kinds of disciplines that were once discrete jobs or occupations? Um, the, the more we electrify operations at the port, the more you see emerging of transportation and energy. Right, that's going to create new skills, new opportunities for energy engineers. Right, um, but even at entry level positions or positions that have been thought of as being non-skilled, um, you know, truck driving is one that people talk about, sort of being where the biggest need has been. There's going to be a change coming there um, with the introduction of connected and autonomous vehicles over the longer term. Uh, but it's certainly in the near to the short, the short to the near term. Um, there will be opportunities for those truck drivers to become skilled in, um, in software programs because uh, I don't know any state that's going to allow fully 
autonomous trucking without somebody in the cab to override that system, to read the output, to do the, the, the analytics. Now that's going to require a significant amount of, of training, um, but it is where I think we should be looking to make sure that the adjustments to the workforce are as predictable as possible. Most of us are starting to grudgingly come to realize that yes, um, automated cars, automobiles will be in our future, driverless cars. So if we're talking about trucks, we can also talk about trains, even freight trains, cargo freight trains, mm -hmm. as well as uh, ships, yes. ocean liners. They're already looking into that and experimenting with autonomous um, ships, which I guess could be guided through GPS tracking and that sort of thing. Right. So if that happens, um, is it realistic to then look at freight being moved without much human intervention along the way? Yeah, but you know, this again is, is part evolution and part revolution. There are already systems that can control the operations in a cab or in a wheelhouse, wherever it might be. Um, and so we're sort of moving toward a more autonomous situation, but it is already happening in fits and starts right now. Um, the number of people who um, uh, come over on an ocean carrier right now with all of those containers, um, is, is a lot less than it used to be before the onset of containerization. So that's also an evolution. But I do think we are preparing for a time in which um, autonomous trucks, autonomous ships, um, autonomous uh, um, rail cars are, you know, sort of part of the part of the standard operating procedure. We are already seeing um, semi-autonomous trucks um, uh, moving U.S. Postal Service goods between Arizona and Texas, right? Those tests are already occurring with commercial providers. Well, let's talk a little bit about an analogy that some people have used over the years with technology, and that is when the automobile came into existence in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of people said, well, what about the people that take care of horses and handle the horses and build saddles and things like that? in relation to uh, true horsepower using horses. So right. with the horseless carriage, um, there were the fears that a lot of jobs would go by the wayside, but in fact, the, all, all kinds of new industries developed related to the automobile, not just building the automobile itself, but supplying it with gasoline, also building freeways. And when we built the freeways, then we could build housing tracks, suburban housing tracks, so people could move to the suburbs. And then you had the drive-through restaurants, drive-through banking, drive-through pharmacies. So the mm. car has generated a whole new world of industries, including auto insurance. And so if we see these autonomous vehicles, trucks, cars, ships, trains, etc., are there going to be analogous industries that uh, develop that are ancillary to the fact that these are autonomous vehicles? Yeah, and, I, and to your list, I would add, you know, the ocean container, which everyone feared that that standardization would eliminate the, the need for workers on the docks. And that wasn't the case. The, the efficiency of, of goods movement meant that we moved more goods and there was a need for more dock workers. So I would agree with you to a certain extent. I do think, though, we are observing some structural changes that are brought about by increased use of technology and automation, particularly at entry level. Which, which could very well mean that there are fewer positions there. Um, and how do we address that so that, we, that social mobility, which we've always come to depend upon as a means toward advancement to the middle class and, and beyond, is still an opportunity for, for people who, um, who are looking to enter the workforce. So I agree with you. I think there will be a host of high order technology driven uh, work that requires a lot of abstract thinking. The question is, how do we take, make sure that, that, that people become skilled enough um, so that they're able to take on those positions um, if those entry level positions are no longer there because of automation or technology? So that puts the focus back on training, job training, right. education. What do we have to do in education? Do we need to retool? the institutions? Do we need to think in a broader way? Do we need to get outside of the box, to use that cliche? Yeah, I think we do. I mean, it's something that I confront on a daily basis in, in my position. Um, 
I think we, at the university, uh, we need to think about how and when we train. The traditional cycle of a summer off, right, that people don't need to be trained in the summer, um, just is no longer the case. Um, to stay on ahead of the curve uh, and to serve an audience that wants programs and needs programs in a very dynamic economy, uh, we have to change the way we offer programs. Traditional degree programs will remain valuable. Programs that teach things like abstract thinking and, and data analysis are critical. But I think we're going to need to compare or to combine them with um, certifications that the industry recognizes. So as you're getting an MBA, you're also getting an industry recognized certification in um, supply chain management so that you balance the academic learning with really nuts and bolts skills that make you ready for the job on day one. I think we need to teach um, what you know sort of used to be called soft skills that are not really soft, they're foundational. Um, tools that employers are demanding and increasingly communications tools, writing tools um, that uh, I think partly because of generational changes are not emphasized as much. Um, that helps make the person as employable as possible from day one. We only have a minute now until the end of the show. Tom, if we are talking about new skill sets, a new way of thinking about learning and teaching, we're really talking about lifelong learning here yeah. and that the learning process is the journey. It's the learning process and lifelong learning is what we have to really encourage. How do we get people to realize that the skills you know today are not going to be the same that you're going to need? five, 10, 15 years from now? How do we do that? Well, we do a couple of things. One is that we change the notion of what it means to graduate, right? And how we engage with, with our students, providing opportunities for refresher courses for people to come back. And also to recognize that you're not done once you accept that position. Uh, I think, you know, the, the half-life of a, of a technology-based skill on the job now is about three to four years. So entering, um, entering the workforce with the mindset that to stay ahead of the curve, you're going to constantly have to be learning. Some of that is going to be your own responsibility. I also think it will change the way employers approach professional development so that it is not the expectation that uh, the degree will provide, will provide all that they're going to have to be part of the the, uh, the solution, as many already are, in making sure that the workforce that they have um, is up to the task. On that, we'll have to uh, close out the program, but thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.